in 2007, Chris Benoit, who I'd known for years, wrestled for WWE, you know, didn't show up to a, a show, and they found that he had uh, killed his wife and son. And he and I had had a conversation uh, months or a year prior um, where he had confided in me his concerns about his concussions. And so I coordinated his brain to be studied 10 days after I had, had actually signed the paperwork to start the Concussion Legacy Foundation. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Dr. Chris Nowinski, welcome to our podcast. You have such a fascinating story. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. Chris, I read that you grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. What was your family like? Any siblings? What did your parents do? So I was born in Oak Park, Illinois, just uh, just west of Chicago, um, which was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, I didn't even realize until recently I learned it was uh, sort of a designed, diverse neighborhood and one of the first in the country. Um, and then uh, my dad worked at Northwestern at that point in food service. So he was a food service manager and did hotel work and things like that. Uh, my mother was a social worker and uh, stopped that to, to raise me and my two sisters. I have an older sister, Susan, who's 18 months older, and a younger sister, Mary, who's five years younger, who still live in the area. And when I was 10, we moved uh, to Arlington Heights, Illinois, a little further out uh, northwest. Uh, but it was a great time to, to be growing up there. I was a big uh, fan of the you know, 85 Bears and all that. I'm, I'm that old. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was my life growing up was just, uh, you know, wonderful parents, wonderful sisters playing sports and, and focus on school. I saw that you were a dominant player in high school and you chose Harvard University. Was it a difficult choice? Who were your top three schools and why did you ultimately pick Harvard? Well, first I want to find out who told you I was a dominant high school player. I wasn't <laughs> even all state, but I was okay. I was okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I was lucky. So I, I decided before my senior year, I was getting inquiries for both football and basketball to, to play in college and decided I was going to go with football, uh, knowing that I had topped out at 6'5". And I was getting basically inquiries from MAC schools, like the Northern Illinois, Western Michigans of the world, and Ivy League schools. And you know, looking back on it, you know, being at that point, 16, 17 years old, I was all, I was really interested in wanting to be a scholarship athlete. There was something cool about, you know, going to a Mac, you know, being, you know, getting a free ride and, and all that recruiting stuff that went with it. But um, I think the Ivy League was now looking back a better choice for me. And I, luckily my head coach, Bruce Glover, was uh, of the same mindset. I very vividly remember him saying, look, if, uh, and it was, the, the line was, if Harvard asks you to come play for them, you don't turn them down. And that was, I mean, one of the biggest reasons I chose them. So my the only three schools I took visits to were Harvard, Brown, and Princeton. And um, Harvard, I had the, um, I felt the best connection to while I was on campus. So like, looking back, you realize that a lot of those choices at the end, a lot of these schools are very similar. It comes down to random things like, when I went to Brown, it was negative 10. When I went to Princeton, there were four feet of snow on the ground, so the campus was shut down. When I went to Harvard, it was a random 65-degree day in March where everyone was out you know, <laughs> playing in the yard, the Frisbee, and having a good time. And I was like, oh, this place is great. So, uh, But I was yeah, lucky to be invited to play at Harvard and um, had a really good time there. Did you have great grades in high school, or was it you know, more athletics that uh, got you there? 
I, uh, it, I led with grades. I was uh, uh, the top tier on the uh, academic index, which helped. Yeah, I think they, they, so I was recruited because they, you know, you need people at that, the way the Ivy League does it at the top end. So I, um, I, mean, I, I, when I got a car, I started slacking off a bit. So I got a B uh, and I, you know, so I ended up being, yeah, uh, I, I was, I was a uh, 1500 SAT guy and uh, you know, I think it ranked in the top five in the class, so it was enough. That'll do it. <laughs> I was more of a late bloomer in sports, to be honest with you. I, I, my coach told me he didn't expect a whole lot out of me, but he needed somebody with those grades on the list. <laughs> so in college, you played football and were second team all Ivy League and graduated with honors with a degree in sociology. One of the big things that you're working on now revolves around concussions. So I wanted to ask, how many concussions do you think you had up to that point in your life? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, again, when, when you're talking to uh, a guy who had a great career in the NFL, when they say, remark, you were a second team all Ivy, you, you know, it makes you feel small. <laughs> um, uh, so I, uh, you know, I had a really great experience at Harvard. Um, at that time, my understanding of concussion was you had to be knocked out. And I vividly remember one of my best friends getting knocked out uh, doing box jumps, like slipping, falling back, hitting his head, and thinking he was soft because he couldn't practice the next day. And so now that I look back, I just remember two two times at Harvard where I think I was hit hard enough. Like one time, definitely like the sky changed colors and I was a little woozy. Another time where I was, uh, you know, blasted and, and remember like calling people by the wrong names in the dining hall afterwards, but you know, small, small things. Right. And I certainly remember like during every preseason, and I don't know if you remember, this was the same for you, but you know, I was somebody who had bad shoulders. <laughs> I've always had bad shoulders. And so, and I wasn't that strong, so I could never develop like great bench press strength. So I used my head to hit. And during two a days, we'd all, the D lineman would talk about how, you get a three-point stance and you feel like you were going to pass out because you could feel the blood pooling in your head. Um, I'm not sure if you felt that, but uh, so I, I don't know if what led to that feeling would have been hits that caused concussion or if that was just normal wear and tear. But anyway, so I don't, I never had one, I never had a concussion diagnosed for the, you know, until I graduated, until after college. But I'm sure I had some mild ones in college I never told anyone about. And then, you know, I was pretty reckless as a young person. I probably had concussions then too, but I was never knocked out. But sorry, I'm, I'm even forgetting my own concussions. So, because I'm, I'm sort of going through like the book I wrote in 06 of This Is My History, because it was more recent. I do remember though, I've, I've put in some of my, my recent lectures, you go home for Christmas and your parents are trying to get rid of your stuff that's still in the basement. My mother gave me a couple of years ago, a discharge, uh, record from when I was four years old and uh, fell off of a kitchen table and hit my head. And I was diagnosed at the emergency room with a, with a concussion. And I didn't even know about it until recently. So the, my concussion started at least at four, but, but that was the only one I had diagnosed before uh, graduating college. And so the concussion concussion for how you're using it is knocked out or you're saying concussion even like whatever sub concussions or lower level concussions so i guess what i'm saying is i never had a diagnosed concussion and i was never knocked unconscious however now that i know what the definition is i'm almost certain i've had some mild con- you know m- mild meaning like i don't sure. you know i don't remember months of problems I, but i remember acute symptoms a handful of times but I also, you know, thinking back to like flashbulb memories of, you know, whacking your head on the ground and being nauseous. Um, yeah. That I, I, you know, it's almost, and, and also interviewing enough athletes over the last 20 years of, you know, feeling like you had a ding every week or every month while you're playing. Like I played enough to get enough of those dings. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think, I think uh, <laughs> my dad, somebody asked my dad how many concussions he, he had. I could let you tell the story. He said, someone said, how many concussions do you think you had? Um, I think when you were at Syracuse. And I, I might misquote this, but didn't you say you stopped counting once you got to 12? 
Yeah. And that was before, that was before the NFL, <laughs> which was a heck of a lot more violent. Yeah. It's crazy hearing you say it out loud. Because it was during, it was, it was actually while I think, I'm not, I could be wrong. You're definitely going to know more about this than me, but I think the definition of concussion changed while I was playing because it was, you were soft, you were a pansy, you were all that stuff. If you had a headache and you didn't go in. Right. And it was, it was a very concussion meant unconscious, not moving. It didn't like, if you hit your head and you're like, Whoa, I'm seeing stars. Like, Hey, you got dinged, yeah, dinged up or you got, you got your, you know, you got rocked or you got whatever, take a play or two and then get back in. <laughs> Well, it wasn't until 2009 that we got the NFL to acknowledge that putting people back in who were knocked out was a bad idea and that not every concussion involved that. So, yeah, you were, yeah, I'm guessing that's when you were playing. So I was playing when I was in, when I was in high school, 2011 was my senior year, 2011, 2012. And I had, uh, that was the first year, because I remember in like, high school let me think i i don't remember there being like a noticeable difference until when i was in college and they stopped that was the year they stopped doing full contact two days my freshman year we did it and my sophomore year we they weren't allowed to anymore and i was no one was happier in the country than me for that that rule anyways i the reason i asked chris about the definition for you know concussion how you're using it is just for viewers or people listening who, who you know aren't aware i think that the, the word the word's meaning has drastically changed in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, it's it's drastically changed culturally. So, you know, medically, it's actually they've all you know always known that you didn't have to be knocked out, but culturally, it became you had to be knocked out. Although there's a famous article in New England Journal of Medicine in 2007 where the editor of the journal said they had to be defined. He wrote an editorial in response to all this hubbub about NFL concussions, saying, "Well, concussion is defined by loss of consciousness." And everyone was like, "Whoa." The New England Journal of Medicine doesn't have this right in 2007. Like, we got some work to do. And then one other piece of data I'll tell you is that whenever we talk about studies of number of concussions, like, we're going back and forth. None of us really know our number, and it's hard to remember what happened in the past. But now there are studies showing, too, if you ask the same athlete year after year while they're playing, they'll give you different numbers because they can't remember. Like, these things aren't, like, written down or notched on your bedpost. And so it's hard to know. After you graduated from Harvard, you went to work as a pharmaceutical and biotechnology consultant. What did that entail and where did that come from? Yeah, I was very lucky through the Friends of Harvard Football to get an internship with uh, Trinity Partners, who were founded by a gentleman named John Corcoran, who's still on my, my board of directors at the Concussion Legacy Foundation, and where I was managed by Dave Fitzhenry, also still on the board. So it was a great uh, time for me. At that point, I was basically, we were hired by big pharma companies to help them. Um, Usually, my role was helping them better bring drugs, to uh, develop drugs in certain places. So, like, I remember, like, one of the fascinating projects that helped sort of get me interested in this area was there was a molecule this company owned that they thought could work for five different neurological disorders. And the job was to figure out, well, which one should we pursue based on likelihood of success, based on, you know, the, the profit, potential profitability, based on competition, based on all these different things. And so we would sit there and try to, you know, do these analyses to try to understand, like, what is the right business move when you have something with so many unknowns, uh, like, like, a, like a drug molecule. At what point did you start training for professional wrestling and what gave you the idea to do it? Also, I have to ask you, did Goldberg have any influence on your decision? He's a good friend of mine and was our first episode of the podcast. Goldberg specifically did not. Um, although I'm certain that, I, you know, just understanding the trail of he showed me in a very acute way at that point that you can go from football to wrestling. Um, what, what actually happened was it was this, it was this job. So, so I worked at Trinity before my senior year as an intern. At the end of the summer, they said, you know, like, you can do the job, like come back and work for us when you graduate. It's great. So then during the school year, to make a few extra bucks, I would work during, uh, you know, I remember working during intercession and it, it, between semesters. And at that point, <clears throat> I was talking to the boss. He was a big wrestling fan. I was a big wrestling fan. We were watching 
Raw and SmackDown every week. It was back in, uh, you know, we're talking 99, 2000, where, you know, The Rock and Stone Cold and everyone's like really going on fire. And uh, over a lunch conversation, he was like, you know, and I was training for NFL workouts and, you know, worked out for a bunch of teams, primarily because three guys on my team were all signed. I was the fourth. Um, and he said, you know, if you don't get drafted, would you consider uh, giving pro wrestling a try? I think you would be good at it. And, I, and this job will always be here if it doesn't work out. And so that I said, you know, actually I had a, a history in theater. I dabbled it in high school and like was in West Side Story and did some drama in college. I enjoyed it. I really, so I said, all right, sure, I, I'll give it a try. And what that turned into, like not knowing what that meant, was that like two days after the draft happens, I don't get, I don't get drafted, I don't get, the, uh, don't get signed. He calls uh, the boss, calls uh, Jerry Jarrett, who he knew um, through old friend connections, who used to run Memphis, the Memphis territory, Jeff Jarrett's dad, who then calls J.J. Dillon, and they basically say, "Hey, we got this Harvard guy. You think we should, you guys should check out? He's big." And so suddenly I've got two tickets going to the WCW power plant in Atlanta where Mr. Wonderful runs it, Paul Orndorff, and they gave me a tryout and they like beat the snot out of me for a day. And I'm literally running around the rings. I'm like bleeding off my side because, you know, we're like running into steel cables. And he, and at the end of those, at the end of that day, he's like, Hey, you should give this a try kid. You know, you, 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 you might be able to do it. He wasn't able to break me, which I think was really his goal. Um, so, so I went, so I fly back North and they knew I needed to get my shoulder work done. So they basically said, when your shoulder's fixed in six months, come see us. And so I started working at the consulting firm over those six. And I started getting a wrestling safe, but I dropped like 50 pounds, went from fat lineman to a guy with some abs. I didn't know I had them. I'd never seen them before. Um, <laughs> and by the time that six months was up and I was ready, WCW had a hiring freeze and was about to go out of business. And so I had to go find Killer Kowalski's wrestling school. I'd already got the bug. So I found Killer Kowalski's wrestling school and would go wrestle nights, Tuesday, Thursday night and weekends while working like a 35 hour a week job. They let me leave early a couple days a week and, uh, and you know, just felt just completely fell in love with it. And then I went from Kowalski's and having one match in front of a crowd to WWE announced they were doing a reality television show with MTV called Tough Enough. <clears throat> and I said, well, you know what? If I want, want to get to there, I might as well try this shortcut uh, the way I saw it. Because you got to pay. And in those days, you had to pay your dues. That's not really a thing anymore. Um, and uh, so I sent in a tape. And suddenly, I'm in Times Square uh, at the WWE restaurant doing a tryout being recorded, uh, you know, where they whittled 400 people down to 13 people who lived in a house in Stanford, Connecticut together, training for the WWE and being recorded 24 hours a day. And I did that. What's the tryout like? I mean, what is that? What is the tryout? Are you, are you doing more of like, is it more like acting where you're, you're kind of doing lines and, and using your whatever, I guess your catchphrase, or is it more athleticism where, like you said, running into the, the steel cage? Yeah. So at that time, like the, the tryout, you know, the simple tryout, one day tryout at WCW was physical. Um, the it when it was on Tough Enough, even at that point, it was probably 80 um, percent the physicality and the psychology of wrestling versus like creating a character and doing the talking. Like now back then they didn't have acting coaches. Now they do. It's a little more um, sophisticated in that realm. But mm -hmm. back in my day, it was a little more sink or swim, like either figure it out or don't. So, but it was really like pro, pro wrestling is most, I mean, it was, I loved it because it was, I found it even more challenging than football, like both physically, but especially mentally. Like the idea of like holding this entire, you know, potentially 20, 30 minute narrative of a match and the history of that match leading to every movement you do, every move you do, every facial, you know, thing you do. Um, keeping that all in your mind in real time in front of a live audience was was just like uh, it was fun and fascinating and and exciting. So you would basically have to learn the basics of the simplest moves and to the more complex ones, then how to put them in an order that means something, and then in, then you know how to turn that into a, an actual match that tells a story that 
the crowd would actually care about and want to see. And when you, you know, when I go to WrestleMania, you know, a lot of years now, and you actually see what that art form is by the best people in the world, it, it is really something. And having done theater, I used to always get bored, like the third night you did theater. Uh, but wrestling was always live, always new, and that was always interesting. I watched several clips of your portrayal of Chris Harvard, and I think you were brilliant. But then, just as you started to get on a roll, you suffered a concussion that drastically changed your life. Could you please tell us what happened? Were you knocked out cold, or were you woozy? Yes, Chris Harvard died in June 2003, a slow death. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, I got to play this wonderful heel character and that meant, you know, the fans would enjoy watching me get the snot kicked out of me. And it just so happened we were in a, doing a show in the Hartford civic center and it wasn't well attended because it was like a Sunday night and, uh, the crowd wasn't very loud. And there was a wrestling the Dudley boys and I was supposed to go in the corner, get kicked in the chin. And I, you know, I just went in too fast. Um, you know, just trying to make it look more dynamic. And I got caught and, and was hit. And by the time I hit the ground, I wasn't unconscious, but I was, I, my brain was not working normally. So I remember an extraordinary headache. And I remember that I couldn't remember what the rest of the match was. So I went from being the Harvard guy who never forgot anything in the ring and you could always count on to be in the right place at the right time to what are we doing out here? What's next? I don't know the finish of the match. And and you go into this enormous panic mode because it's a very dangerous thing when you actually don't know what's happening. And so the problem was in 03, there was no concussion culture. I didn't know what was going on. No one else knew what was going on. And there were no guidelines to say, hey, if somebody is in this very dangerous situation, they don't know what's happening, stop the match, which is now what I train the wrestlers to do. And I'm invited in to do that, which is really wonderful. But so, yeah, I just uh, we just finished the match. I kept getting hit. And then the athletic trainer stopped me on the way out, knowing that the match got messed up and said, are you all right? And I lied and said, I'm fine. And I just like went and hid with my head throbbing for hours and just refused to tell anyone how bad I felt over the next few days and fit, wrestled a couple more matches. Then I was got a little scared and told them how I felt. And luckily they they had me stop wrestling. I went and saw a doctor, he said maybe I had a concussion. And, uh, but, and so take a week off. I took a week off. I wasn't feeling better, but I was feeling pressure to go back. And so I lied to the doctor who was my friend's father and said, I I'm all better now. Can you clear me? And I cleared me. I went back, kept getting more hits, kept getting worse. And I uh, had to stop after sort of five weeks after the first concussion, apparently like wasn't making sense. And they didn't let me wrestle a match. And, uh, and that night I had my first REM behavior disorder where I uh, acted out a dream and, and jumped you know, off a bed through a nightstand not knowing what was going on. And uh, that's what it took to sort of get me to realize like I did something in my head. And uh, I told them what happened and, and they said, you're not, you're not going back until this, you know, we get this figured out. And it just the symptoms never went away. And so it just became a 15 year headache and this, this chronic sleep disorder. And, um, you know, I couldn't exercise without getting nauseous, um, uh, for, for almost 20 years. So that was, uh, I did a little, I did a little damage. Did you initiate a lawsuit or workman's comp claim against the WWE? I did not. Um, I didn't really consider it. Like I did a, like back then, you're a, in pro wrestling, you're all independent contractors. And then also, um, you know, I, I didn't know what the future was. Right. So like after a year, um, you know, they, like I, I, at that point I had a hot start, like, you know, in, in the, they had a magazine called raw magazine that they, that they made, but in 2002, they called me the newcomer of the year. And that was like in a class of like Brock Lesnar and John Cena and all these guys were legends. And like, I was in that realm back then in our first you know year or two and so i wanted to go back and so it never really crossed my mind and then when i decided i can't go back i also had learned enough by then to realize like nobody knew right so i ended up writing this book in a, you know called head games in 06 where it's like the nfl had been actively covering this up it wasn't really uh a, you know it's not that the WWE didn't want me to be safe and get better they just concussion protocols were not a thing and so um, 
So no, I didn't. I didn't. So they did give me. They did continue to employ me as uh, to do charitable work through 2007, and they did give me an injury settlement once I told I wasn't going to come back. But um, so they they took care of me. Um, but yeah, no 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 lawsuit, and I don't think it was more of a cultural problem than a specific company problem. It doesn't sound like you have any animosity towards the WWE either. Is that is that fair to say or no? Yes, today, absolutely. I mean, it, there's been up and downs, um, you know. So, so you know, um, you mean, I mean, we don't have to go into this in, in depth. But in 2007, Chris Benoit, who I'd known for years, wrestled for WWE, you know, didn't show up to a, a show, and they found that he had uh, killed his wife and son, and then ki- killed himself. And he and I had had a conversation uh, months or a year prior. Um, where he had confided in me his concerns about his concussions. And so I coordinated his brain to be studied 10 days after I had, had actually signed the paperwork to start the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And um, I didn't realize this, but what they did that, like, I couldn't vote, I, that opened up a whole world of exposure for them. Of, like, if Chris Benoit had CTE, what would that mean for the company if, that he was working for? And so they basically, you know, said like, look, you can pursue this path, but you can't work here. <laughs> and then, so that became uh, different. But then they invited me back more than 10 years ago to start training the wrestlers. And, and Triple H has been on our board of directors, and they've been very generous supporters of this research. So that's been one of the more rewarding things about this, is that while the NFL has fought us for years, WWE actually has embraced this stuff. And it's a much, they, they really take pride in how much safer it is. Did Chris Benoit disclose to you how many concussions that he thought he had had when he was saying he was worried about it? The conversation was, so, I mean, you can imagine, like, so this is, I, back then I was like, you know, walking on eggshells in the sense of getting hurt in 2003, 2004, half the people thought I was just, would, and would say this when I came to the locker room, you know, get out of here, you're just stealing a check from the company. You're faking this injury. You're fine. And uh, and other other people had seen it before and they knew what I was going through. And he was one that took me seriously, but he's the only one to ever ask me about this book I was writing. And he said, he sat me down and said, like, what are you learning about concussions? How many concussions did you have? And then I, I told him, and I, so I said, how many concussions have you had? He go, and he said, I've had, I've had more than I can count. Um, and, and he had given me his phone number um, that for the first time right there and then he said, call me next week because he had more follow-up questions. And I didn't back then realize what this could become. And so I called him next week. He sounded like he was in the middle of an argument. And he said, I'll call you back. And he never called me back. And so when, when I learned what happened, uh, you know, and I'd already started involved, being involved studying the brain of Andre Waters and Justin Strelzik, who was hearing voices uh, before getting chased with the police at 36 and knew about Mike Webster, uh, it, it fit the pattern for me. And so I was like, oh, crap, I, you know, I, I missed this. I had a chance to intervene. I had a chance to help this guy. I had a chance to help his family. I didn't realize like, if I would have just been more persistent in trying to help him. So that's, that's how I've always looked at that. And it turned out he did have severe CT. More severe than the football players at that point. Do you think that's just that lifestyle of, I mean, his, his wrestling side, I liked watching the WWE growing up, and that was the – he was in the era that I watched. I mean, he was he was known for high risk, kind of jumping off the ropes and hitting his head on people's heads. Like that was that was one of his moves. Do you think that's the – do you think it's those, those kind of bigger impact things that did it, or do you think it's the constant lifestyle of WWE, or why do you think he had, I guess, a worse version of CTE than the typical NFL one you've seen? It's a good question. I mean, so we don't see any correlation now that we've studied 1,500 brains between lifestyle and pathology. So basically, the only thing that's known to start the disease is the head impacts. And then after that, it's going to be some some combination of genetics and, and modifiable risk factors um, that we don't really understand yet. And so, uh, so for him, I do think it was style related, right? He was always... Um, he, he did choose to take more risks in, and I, you know, re- remarking even back then, like we'd gotten to a weird place with chair shots in wrestling. So now they're banned for chair shots in the head, but back then they weren't. And there was, when I got in, it went from, you put your hand up and it never touches you because this is insane to 
put your hands down and prove to the fans how tough you are. And that was a little bit of a combination like that was ECW style and it had a following and also the internet and the rest of I remember this like Al Snow would sort of tell the story. Once every wrestler could see that what the fans were saying, they started responding to it, like on the chat rooms. And there was a certain type of fan who liked when the chair shots were real. And some people played into that. And so Chris would do things like let people hit him in the back of the head with a chair, which is not something that you can react to, right? If you, kind of, if you see it coming, you can get your head out of the way and it's not a real strike, but he would take real strikes. You retired from professional wrestling in 2003 and wrote a book. What else were you busy with until you formed your foundation in 2006? Is this when you met your wife and decided to start a family? Uh, so when I got hurt, um, I would, uh, and, and WWE, we uh, were still doing some stuff, but it wasn't enough to be busy. I went back to Trinity Partners, now known as Trinity Life Sciences, and I just worked hourly. Like they knew I was very badly post-concussed and they were very generous finding things that I could do between headaches hourly. Um, there, so I, I, they gave me an office and sort of kept an eye on me and let me write head games from that office and then conceptualize and start to develop the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And then they actually had it there at their office. So that was 2006, the book came out, 2007, we started the foundation, created the partnership with Boston University. Um, but no, I didn't meet my wife till 2009, and um, and then we didn't start a family until 2018. Uh, you know, part you know, and and I I waited partially because she's younger and I could, but partially because I wanted to wait for the headaches to stop, and I wanted to also finish my PhD so I could give enough time to the kids because, as you know, they take a lot of time. Troy, I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't appreciate it till I had my own kids. And I was like, Oh crap. I got to go say thank you a couple more times. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I mean, can you describe what it was like for somebody that's never, <clears throat> everyone's concussion seems like it's so, they're so different, but I've had, I've had a couple of concussions before, but I never had, I personally never had lingering, you know, headaches that lasted. I think mine lasted, you know, a day, nothing like, you know, 15 years. I mean, what was it like migraines or what did it feel like or look like for, for you or for people who saw you? Yeah. Um, and, and I'm the same way that I never had a symptom last longer than a day to my knowledge, you know, besides like some of those things that I'm not sure were concussion symptoms until this last concussion. And even then, so, I mean, I guess it'd be best to find as post-traumatic headaches. And I eventually learned like they were, they were, caused by a lot of different things, but including my sleep cycle got screwed up. And so I'd wake up with headaches a lot. And once I got that under control, they did they start to go away. But if it was something was too loud or if something was too stimulating or my head was in the wrong position. So I think I did more damage than I realized to the back of my neck. And so my cranial nerves that I've now learned over time, if I had nipped that in the butt early, it might've been better. So, you know, not headaches aren't technically coming from your brain in the sense that you can't feel pain in your brain. You don't have pain nerves. So there's a lot of different reasons you get them. Um, and for mine, it was just, you know, it was too bright. If the weather changed, like I, would, I just had a very, we had developed a very sensitive head. Well, I, I didn't, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm a novice with this stuff. I'm not like, like you are, but where, so where headaches, when you feel a headache, since there's no pain receptors, I guess, in your brain, what is that that you're feeling? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I'll, I'm going to quickly get out over my skis. We have a great podcast with Dr. David Dodick talking about this uh, for the Concussion Legacy Foundation. So it was a, the world's expert. But um, but basically, like, you know, you're talking about there's a lot of nerves, like, under your, like, you know, inside your skull, surface of your brain. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, you know, and then you, you talk about the vascular system of your brain. And... Your, your your concussions can, or sorry, your headaches can be coming from just changes in um, you know, the, the relationship between the vascular system, the nerves, um, your cranial nerves, the things on the surface of your your head. There's, you know, frankly, I don't, I don't have a great answer. I, <laughs> I don't get asked that question, right. but it's not. It's, but basically, it's the idea of like if you had a tumor in your brain, 
or someone stuck a knife through your brain, you wouldn't feel that, right? And so it's not like, so I, anytime people's problems are headaches and they're post-concussed, I tell them, well, good news is <clears throat> it's not really your brain. You know, like there's a separation sort of between cognition and headaches that can make you feel good. Yeah, you know, I just never heard that before. That's what made me ask. Yeah, no, but you forget. Like you don't, for, you forget that when your brain is slapping around inside your skull, you're not feeling it. And that's why I think partially why we're so reckless with it is because we could feel it. We'd, do, we'd be a lot, you know. And it's also why your scalp is so sensitive. It's sort of your way to protect your brain. And that's why you realize when you put helmets over it, you sort of take away that natural feedback of keeping your head out of trouble. Please tell us about the formation of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. How did you get connected with Boston University and such heavyweight doctors and scientists? Can you describe doctors McHale and Cantu for us? Sure. So, so when I wrote Head Games, I wrote like a spoke about post-concussion and this idea that Concussions were a lot worse than we realize. They're a lot more common than we realize. Athletes don't know what they are, so they're not telling anyone about them. And and also, by the way, there's this thing, CTE. I wrote one chapter about because I got hurt when the first two NFL players were diagnosed by Bennett Amalu. And so when nobody cared about the book and I realized that it was so hard to get people to talk about concussions because they're invisible and they're mostly short term and, you know, it becomes this like if you have chronic issues, everyone questions you. I realized that CTE was that way to get people to realize that those head hits matter. And so, because it's visible, you can see it under a microscope. You can see the difference between healthy tissue and CT tissue. So when Andre Waters took his life in 06, uh, one time for the story, but reached out to the medical examiner, ended up courting the brain study, and then convinced the New York Times to put it on the front page when it came back positive that, hey, if guys are killing themselves because of this disease, people need to know about it. And then the Justin Strelzik story I referenced earlier, where a couple years or a year prior, he had lost his mind and died and tracked down his mother in the medical examiner and had that brain study that still was there. And then, uh, and then realized, okay, this was like, if we keep proving to everyone that these really early deaths and strange outcomes and psychiatric symptoms, all this, if they are, and I, you know, we can go into what we now know, but the hypothesis was if we can continue to accrue this evidence, we can get people to change how they think about these injuries. And so that's when I realized like, well, you need, if you need, I learned you need this thing called a brain bank to actually study the brain. So you need a, a medical school would be the best way to do that. And I also was really upset about the NFL, you know, crapping on this research in the early days, they realized, okay, it's one thing if they want to accuse like individual doctors or me of not knowing what I'm talking about, but it'll be different if a school puts their name behind a medical school and they have to go to war with the medical school because people trust medical schools. And then, uh, and so I started like conceptualizing what the Concussion Legacy Foundation would be, and it would be to partner with the medical school, start the brain bank and build the advocacy out of the evidence. And Dr. Cantu, Dr. Robert Cantu was my treating doctor. He was the eighth doctor I saw trying to put me back together and fix me. And, uh, and he was, unbeknownst to me when I first met him, one of the world's experts on this, who had written the first return to play guidelines for concussions in sports in 1986. And was just a, just a hell of a guy. And so I shared this idea with him and he said, go for it. I'll attach my name to it. I'll do whatever you need to make this happen which was very generous of him because he you know, had a huge reputation at the time and a lot to, a lot to lose. And then we, then we thought, okay, how do we find this medical school? And there's lots of stories in there, but when it came down to BU, it was just so happened that I was living with a buddy, Kevin, back then who worked at, um, who worked at Merrill Lynch, I think at the time. And he saw a lecture by a professor at BU named Bob Stern, where he talked about, the new research on CTE. He's an Alzheimer's researcher, and he thought that the CT stuff was really interesting because it might explain why there was a historical connection between brain injuries and Alzheimer's, but it was not understood. And he set up a meeting. Uh, he knew someone who knew him. He set up a meeting for me, I, and I went in and said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And he said, oh, I love this idea. You should do it here. And we have the best uh, neuropathologist in the world to, that I think would do this, and that was Anne McKee. And Dr. Anne McKee uh, I met her and I said, hey, 
at this, you've seen this problem in NFL players in the news. I think we should get more brains and figure this thing out. And she said, let's do it because she understood it as a public health problem that might be preventable. And so it just right people, right time, a lot of serendipity. And, and she was, abs- I was talking earlier today, she's absolutely the right person to do this because it's been a very difficult road, but she's a uh, brilliant and a true believer in the public health value of advancing this work. And so we're now 1,500 brains later, almost 20 years later, and we've redefined what we know about it. Then you became a doctor yourself. This may be what I admire most about you. What gave you that idea? Well, that's very kind of you. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I, I sort of realized the shine of this ex-athlete doing this would wear off eventually. Um, and I wanted to make sure I was making the right choices once I decided I was going to commit my life to this. So I, at that point, it was like 2009, I had an office at BU, and my job was most of the days to seek out, to, to reach out to families after they lost somebody to coordinate this brain donation because it wasn't a known thing in this country. We don't have to do that anymore. They call up, families now call us. But back then, uh, I was doing that. And it just so happened that uh, it was Dr. Stern who said, as long as you're here at BU every day, they teach classes right down the hall. <laughs> Why don't you get a PhD? Uh, to prepare yourself for the you know the next 50 years of this, and so I <clears throat> enrolled part time in the behavioral neuroscience program. So as I built CLF up, I was taking classes, um, and and did the slow train because full time it would have been three years, but part time I, I stretched it to six and a half, but it got it done. In 2022, Tua Tagovailoa, the Dolphins quarterback, goes down with an apparent head injury, and you tweet out a pretty vitriolic, damning statement. You said if the team lets Tua play and gets another concussion, the medical staff and management should be put in jail. Sure enough, the team says it wasn't his head, it was his back. He goes out the next week against the Bengals, and this time he undoubtedly has a head injury. No one who saw can ever forget those twisted fingers and the scary pose that Tua struck from his back. He looked like Nostradamus. But you'll forgive the lawyer and me if I say, isn't it possible that the first injury was really his back? His staggering about would be consistent with a back injury and with all the media coverage and your tweet hanging out there. Don't you think the doctors would dot their I's and cross their T's? No. Um, the simple answer is having spoken to many, many NFL players over the last 20 years, um, most doctors are wonderful people and are there for all the right reasons. But even uh, those who think they're there for the right reasons are subject to the pressures of the moment and the people. And the reason I was so adamant about the original one being a concussion was because it was the the he showed five distinct signs, um, and not all of them could be explained by a back injury, and so um, so that so that's 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 why I was aggressive, and I you know and, and but I've also been doing this forever, like so I've been watching games and calling out concussions and 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 almost always right. <laughs> You know, and eventually it's, oh, yeah, we missed that one. And and we've forced the NFL through this Twitter fights in real time to change their protocols over the years. So we'll remember there's a, a Bengals quarterback who suffered a seizure on the field that they left him in. And next, you know, next week they had a meeting. Oops, we impact seizure. You can't go back in. You know, so, no, my trust for what happens on the sideline historically has been very low. It's getting better. There are far fewer mistakes made, but two was, in my mind, was egregious. I'll go to my grave saying that first one was a concussion. And um, <clears throat> I think they made a mistake playing him. I think they, sh- and I, I was more upset that they didn't err on the side of caution. Even if they truly believed it was a back injury, they shouldn't have. And again, we'll go back to the video and we'll walk through it of uh, why they shouldn't have. But, um, the, to let them play, let them play five days later was risking his life, and and uh, someone needs to speak for those players because Tua doesn't know. He's not steeped in complex neuroscience. He doesn't understand uh, what the role of the sensitivity and specificity of some of the signs he showed are for predicting concussion. So, what do you? And I, was, do you I wasn't going to say anything until I saw the NFL advertising Joe Burrow versus Tua because I 
based on what I know, I think the NFL also knew he shouldn't have been playing, but they can't intervene on a team or else it's tampering. So, of course, they want to market it, but I thought that was unfair to him, and this time I was right. What do you think about the the? Because a lot of times, if you bring up concussions and and football, a lot of times people say something along the lines of, "Hey, they're getting paid all that money. They know the risks. They're adults." And and I can say I didn't I didn't play professionally when I when I was in high school. I definitely didn't know the risks. And when I was in college, I mean, I guess the information's out there, but I don't. I don't you don't really know it until I didn't really know. I knew concussions were bad. I knew CTE existed. I knew it was only in a, a handful of people that had come out. I know, I know your, I think your stance is that it's in a lot more than what we see. Um, but I don't, I don't know how much the players really do, you know, know about it. I, I didn't pay any attention to it. Like I said, it was just kind of out there until um, my dad started having symptoms. That's when I was like, Oh crap, this is, this is real. This is a real thing. Do you think that players know? I don't know how the, the right the right way to phrase the question. Do you think players know the the full consequences? I guess of head collisions. No. no. And how would you how would you go about changing it? Yeah, and the question is, can they? Can because so like one of the things is like from a brain development perspective, your ability to understand the consequences of your actions impacting you forty years from now takes a long time to develop. And so I regularly get contacted by NFL players who now are 23, 24, 25, and they sort of have this wake up moment where they realize I, this may not be worth it. I'm gonna live for a long time and I need my brain. That that doesn't really, like that. that's a brain maturation issue. So I think people wake, some people wake up to the problem in their 20s, other ones choose to go live in a bubble. I mean, how many people like are speaking out there openly like Jason Kelsey, about I probably have CT, but at least I'm setting up wealth. He didn't start saying that till his mid thirties. You know, I don't think. And then when I actually talk to players about the nuts and bolts, most players' first response is, "I've never had concussions. I'm not going to get CTE," and they don't realize that there's no concussions don't predict CT. It's years of play. It's number of and strength of head impacts that's driving CTE. And I don't think most of them especially when they're early and before they've made tons of money, you know, understand that they, you know, what, what this is likely to lead to. And I mean, and that's, again, it, adults can choose to do dangerous things. I just don't think most of them are making an informed choice based on my conversations with them, including people who've played a long time. Um, and, and until we spoke with, until my dad was diagnosed with ALS and then, you know, a year or two later we spoke with, Dr. Marisakovich at, at Massachusetts General Hospital, I thought a concussion was knocked out. That's and and I'm not I'm not saying I speak for, you know, all college players by any means, but you know, I, I feel like um I, I don't I don't think that the right information is out there. I don't uh, the sub the sub concussions, whatever the right terminology is, I don't think that's um I I don't think people know. I don't think people know, frankly. That's that's it. I don't think people know. I, I think people know getting knocked out is bad. I don't think they understand the it's the small a combination of small hits, and it's not. It's it's so hard to say. It's it's so hard to to even talk about because you see people who you, know, you talk about like the eighty five Bears, like the 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 era of football, that eighties nineties football, and, and probably two thousands was the most violent football that, that there ever was, in my opinion, in terms of guys were bigger, the combination of athleticism, size, and, and, and rules, whereas today guys are bigger and faster and stronger, but they don't have the rules protect players a lot better than they did than they did. You know, you see videos now of hits to the, you know, what people used to celebrate and cheer for now are penalties, which is obviously a big a big sticking point with fans and things like that about making the game too safe that it makes it a different game. But um, anyways, I, I don't think people even understand that the, you don't have to be knocked out cold. I think that's a big misconception. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, and it, it, that's 
partially why we fight so hard to keep educating people. And we have a program for educating broadcasters. We started with Bob Costas because that might be the only way to get this, some of this information out because the leagues aren't talking about it. The sports programs don't want to talk about it. They don't want to scare parents away from make, letting their kids play or watching it. And there's sort of this, like, this giant like secret. Like, do you, when you watch a game, do you have fun watching a game? When I was in Boston, I would go to Harvard games and still enjoy it. Um, but when you watch, do you watch the NFL now and enjoy you know, the? When I watch the NFL, like I, you know, I still can get a, drawn in by great plays. Like I still think that they're awesome, especially when no one gets killed on them. But I'm really sort of watching for how they're handling this issue. Are they calling penalties where they should? Are they managing concussions the way they should? You know, um, I don't watch it. I, I don't watch it to, as a fan, but. I don't watch any sports anymore as a fan that that, that wrestling actually killed that for me not this hmm. of, of just sort of getting behind the curtain of big sports i've read that you think you have cte what makes you think that um well my answer to that question just goes back and forth so um i basically know i'm at, I'm at good risk for ct i i know that some scans that we have done on me when i was an early lab rat for some of our studies now when i look back at them are not great they do have signs that could be ct but nothing's you know at this point nothing's definitive so i sort of choose to just live with that anxiety of maybe i do maybe i don't to um help me stay focused on trying to solve this as fast as possible. But the, the other side of that is, that, you know, I, I, this again, nothing my mom sent me from the archives. This is the Harvard football program from my senior year in 99. And my roommate Isaiah there played eight years in the NFL. And, you know, we spoke yesterday and he's, he's doing great. Uh, but that's Chris Eitzman, who we lost two years ago. He played uh, three years in the NFL as a tight end. Um, was you know same year shared a house with Tom Brady as a rookie. Um, played three years, went to you know didn't work out. Got his MBA, ran ran a fund, worked for friends of ours. We saw each other in Boston all the time, and uh, he drank himself to death two years ago in a very horrible way. He nearly killed his kids on the way with uh, drunk driving and and just really dangerous behaviors and. Uh, and he had stage two CT. We studied his brain. And so he only played 11 years of football. I did eight years of football, three years of wrestling, some soccer. Like, so, you know, basically for any of us who played that long, it's, it's, it's possible. And, you know, he was the guy who was elected sole captain at Harvard. He was the best of us. So I don't know, nothing, you know, so I think, that, uh, you know, based on what I've seen with guys of my exposure, if my wife chose to start donating my brain, which I'm going to make her do, my odds would be more than 50-50 based on my experience. Do you think, though, those numbers, Chris, are inflated because the only people that are donating their brains are people, the only families, I guess I should say, donating brains are families that have a concern about it? I mean, so that's, really that's, that's my hope, right? That's yeah. my hope. Uh, and, and the answer is yes, but they, they're probably not as inflated as we'd like them to be. And, and the question is like, so when I framed that, I was just framing it because there'll be a, an article out tomorrow about Jim Tyra. Remember Jim Tyra, Tim? T uh, tackle for the Chiefs in the 70s and 80s. S seven, he has like the most Pro Bowls without being in the Hall of Fame. And he's not in the Hall of Fame because he killed his wife and then himself. Mm -hmm. And played 15 years in the league. And the article is, is sort of focusing on um, did he have it or did he not? And the answer is we've studied 400 NFL players. 91.7% have had CTE. It doesn't tell us what the prevalence is of the percent we didn't study, but what it does tell you is if your family suspects you had CTE and you played in the NFL, the odds are 92%. Yeah, that's that's what I think. I think that's, a, to, to me, I think it's an important way to frame it because there's so many guys that live totally healthy, normal lives. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm more on on your side of this issue than um, than not. I think I think we're in the minority, but I also think it's um, when you see statistics like that. When you say if, if you were to just say 91 percent and not acknowledge that the brains your that families are donating are typically 
I shouldn't say typically because I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm guessing the typical brain that you guys get is something tragic happens and the family says we can't explain why the, this The typical happen. ones are older and had progressive uh, cognitive problems that we now know are very very predictive of CT. So that, uh, two-thirds of them are like 70 or older. We don't hear about that. So these people are lived. I mean, a lot of the families have squirrely stories about what 40s, 50s, and 60s look like, but they, they lived and, and mostly employed. So yeah, you're right. It's, it, it's, it's a, but, the, but the argument put forward by like the anti-CT people is it's a completely skewed sample, not representative, and you can't derive anything from it. And that's not true either. Like, yeah, I, I agree. It's far more prevalent. Like we, we've already agree. proven it's a minimum of 10% of NFL players just based on how many people have had it and how many have died since we started studying. Yeah, yeah I think that's – I just think it's a more genuine way to approach the issue. Oh, yeah. I don't I – don't, I don't, both, both extremes I think are making it worse for ultimately the athlete, right? I think trying to make it sound like everybody has it is bad for the sport in general but also for athletes. I think it could be scaring people oh, out yeah. of – but I, I think the other way too. Uh, guys. You don't want to make it a yeah. scarlet letter that you played and life's going to go bad. Like we say, like for every Junior Seau, there's a Nick Bonacani who just crushed life until his 70s, and then you know it got bad. But um, yeah. and then there's the guys who never had it, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, and sure. So, um, but part of the reason why I like to focus on some of the, you know that we have to be honest about the bad stories is because this is a choice that kids we're asking kids to make, right? It's that idea that this is entirely preventable. No one gets this disease who's not hit in the head thousands of times. And most of the people getting hit in, a thousand, hit in the head thousands of times are under the age of 18 and not getting paid for it. So like we can have that conversation about whether NFL guys can do it and they can choose themselves. But we also then have to move the lens to why do we have all these 10 year olds taking the same risk when there's no benefits? And so, um, so that's why it's we do have to highlight the bad stories. Like I just found out at one of our events that a running back from my high school league who died at 54 had stage three disease, and it was a nightmare to his family. Um, and I didn't know. Like he never played past high school, but he he played in my high school conference in, in uh, Elk Grove, Illinois. And it's like those the, those stories are out there. You only hear about the NFL ones, but there are plenty of high school guys who go down the same path. And we can do better. Not that we have to get rid of it. We have to, we can do better. But Mr. Green, we'll let you ask the next question. Here. Troy, you go ahead and ask Chris your final question. I know he has some questions for me and a hard stop coming up. I want to make sure we have enough time to answer all his stuff. So Chris, every podcast we ask people at the end, um, who they would recommend to be to be on the podcast? Who's somebody's story that we should tell? It has, doesn't have to do anything with football or brain injuries or whatever. It could be really anybody, all walks of life. Who are people that you think uh, you would recommend that we have on, and uh, you know, try and share their story? Well, my whole life is football and brains, but um, <laughs> I was yesterday just talking to um, one of our board members, Jason Redman retired Navy SEAL, who is this, the most amazing guy who was nearly killed, um, you know, serving in Iraq and has this amazing story of resilience and, and leadership, but also really cares about this issue. And he's always a fun guy to talk to. So I would recommend, if I was giving one advice, I'd say, go talk to Jason Redmond. He's a rock star. And he's fun. That's awesome. Thank you, Dr. Nowinski, for the opportunity to get to know you and your most worthy mission. I wish continued blessings on you and your family. Thank you, Tim. It's really an honor to get a chance to meet you after reading about you for so many years. And, you know, a great admirer of the guy who crushed on the NFL field and then wrote a million books and did so many other great things. Um, so great admirer of yours as well. Uh, before we go, I know you, you also had some questions you wanted to ask my dad. Yeah, yeah, no, if you uh, appreciate you taking the time to write some answers. So let me pull them up here. So some of my philosophical football questions for Tim Green. Okay. Um, so my question's for you, sir. So we know that head impacts can cause CT, increase the football player's risk of things like ALS or Lewy body disease. And the relationship is dose-response, meaning the more you play, the more hits, the harder the hits, the greater your risk. 
So what age do you think it's fair or appropriate for children to start playing tackle football and being exposed to this risk that people like you and I carry? I would have said the age that I started, eight years old. But that was before I prepared for this podcast and I read Dr. Cantu's book. Now, I think tackle football should probably start at 14 years old with restrictions. Flag football is just fine. Wow, that is uh, really special to hear. And I'll share that with Dr. Cantu. Thank you. Chris, what's, what's the significance of 14 if, if I haven't read the book? Um, part of, there's, there's brain development is part of it. Your brain, you know, basically, as you watch kids go from children to many adults, adolescents, it's because their brain's changing every day, so it's a bad time to be uh, crushing it. Uh, biomechanics, so puberty and the ability to build muscle mass and the ability for your body to grow up to your head because your head actually grows before your body. So you look, mm -hmm. toddlers look like giant heads on little bodies. Um, that causes, uh, it changes the biomechanics and makes it more dangerous to get hit in the head at that age. Coaching. The oversight of uh, teachers versus the privatization of youth sports. Um, three of the big reasons. Is that where you stand on the issue, Chris? Are you 14 years old? I know oh, yeah. you're. I didn't play till high school. I think it's cruel that kids played before high school. I mean, you know, some of my friends start the kids in eighth grade. I don't give them a hard time. But before that, you know, I mean, so, I mean think about it this way. And, and so to just give you a window, you mentioned Ray Lewis earlier right so i just spent last week go sunday with ray lewis because his son who just diagnosed with ct ray lewis the third who played from age four or five to tw you know in his 20s and he had, uh, um, died of a uh, drug overdose at stage two cte and one of the one of the moms asked me well how do i talk to my son about this and i said well let me let me put it to you this way um the shortcut to this let's not talk about the science let's just talk about how you protect your kid when did you let your kids start lifting weights? And the mom said, oh, I didn't let them do it till 15. And I said, why? Well, I, yeah, I don't want to mess up his joint development. And I said, okay, that's good and that's true. But why would you not apply the same concept to their brain development? Because their brain is so much more important than their, their joints. And, and, it was, and, and a couple of people, including one of the Lewis kids, told me that was sort of a light bulb moment of, if I can't, if I'm not putting them in the weight room, why the hell would I let them go get hit in the head 500 times? Hmm. So that's, that, so anyway, so that's where I'm at with that. The question number two, I want to get Mr. Green's answers here. So Tim, uh, football players who have later life health issues often say we knew what we were getting into. At what age do you think that football players can understand what they're risking and, and how does that inform the youth game? I'm going to say 14 with parents' consent and 16 without. Nope. That, now that yeah, see that now I see the lawyer coming out. I love it. Um, <laughs> all right, and I'm guessing you have answers for the rest of them, so I'll keep going. Um, it's been proven that about at least 10 percent of NFL players and as many as 90 percent have CTE. Why do you think there aren't more current or former players, uh, current or former football players, becoming advocates for CT research? And and how would you suggest we get more to be advocates like you've become such an amazing advocate for ALS research? It's difficult because players don't want to even consider that they could die a horrifying death. NFL football players live in denial. When you are in that world, you don't typically think of your own mortality. Look at me. I kidded myself for two years before I was forced to admit that I had ALS. I put myself through two ulnar nerve relocation surgeries and the fusion of my thumb to try to explain to myself and everyone around me why my hands weren't working. I was desperate for it to be anything other than ALS. So until you have a way of diagnosing it without taking slices of players' brains, you can't count on them. I appreciate you taking the time to write that answer. I, th I think you're dead on. I think you're dead on. You, Chris, isn't that something that you're, you're working on? I don't want to, I don't want to. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you working well, on a way to diagnose CTE? I drew blood today for it. So um, we just started a, a study called Bank CTE. So we're using PET scans to try to image CT, but it's really hard. And you sort of have to build it from the ground up, although we do have colleagues at a few different places doing that. But that's expensive. Even if we do pull it off, it won't be available to everybody. The shortcut is we can now diagnose Alzheimer's uh, disease with um, blood. 
So that basically your blood, when your brain's falling apart, your proteins leak in your bloodstream. So we're following the same path they did for Alzheimer's to get this test two years ago. And we'll probably find out that it works for CT as well. We already think we know what the blood protein ratios are that predict that will be diagnostic for CT based on studying the postmortem brain. So yeah, so Bank CT, I'm, um, I'm encouraging everyone to sign up, go to bankct.org. You sign up, you go to any local Quest lab, you give your blood, you sign up to donate your brain, and um, we'll put those two things together and we'll figure those answers out as quickly as possible. All right, the last questions. Um, there are two more, yeah, the two more questions. All right, so Dartmouth coach, Buddy Tevens was famous for never letting his players tackle each other in practice and using robotic dummies instead. What was your experience like at Syracuse? I did maximum damage to my brain, Chris. I was taught young to lead with my head on every play, to stun the opponent, and then get around them. I played freshman football as an eighth grader and varsity as a freshman. Even in high school, my coaches were old school, hitting every day. And like you, I never came off the field. And that was when you didn't drink water during practice. So I didn't know if I was delirious from the hit or the dehydration. And the NFL was much more violent from a hitting standpoint, especially training camp. Three practices a day, two with full pads, live on every play and every drill. Everyone's big, everyone's strong, everyone's quick, everyone's fast. My head would get so swollen that I had to put Vaseline on my forehead just to get my helmet on, like clockwork. I would take four Advils four times a day. The games were apocalyptic. Bodies like missiles flying around everywhere. You'd get hit sometimes and you'd find yourself in the huddle or on the bench not knowing how you got there. And you better believe you got back in there as soon as you could stand because the NFL stands for not for long. Well, I appreciate you writing all that. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a crazy, vivid story <laughs> yeah. by a storyteller that's right there. That is vivid. <laughs> and it's got to be, I'm, I got to imagine it's odd for you to hear Troy too. Just can't imagine what my dad would tell me. All right, I'll, I'll do the last question since you've prepped. Sorry, go ahead, Troy. Yeah, no, my, my, my dad never, he never tells stories about any of the high school, college, any of this, that we always, we have a joke at my house, Chris, that he, he bragged more to us about being a JV captain of the JV volleyball team or not modified volleyball team than he did about, wrestling or football which were two you know incredible <laughs> careers so. that's funny all right the last question here i had was uh now that it, now that buddy Stevens has passed and there are no there are no college football coaches preaching limited hitting in practice to protect the players from ct or concussions or injuries you know why do you think that is or why do you think that you know, there isn't anybody and and what do you think that says about the, this mantra that we grew up on the, the football teaches character that we're not taking care of our own money the people in charge have a product that makes billions upon billions and the players are all in, especially now that they are getting more of the pie than ever before. Chris, I realized my childhood dreams because of that game and I would have done it again, even knowing that I would end up in this chair. The experiences that I've had and the joy, I have lived three or four lives and I have been blessed by God to stick around and do some of the good I was meant to do this podcast included bringing money to cure this awful disease. And if we cure ALS, we will move on to something else, all to the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a great way to end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for playing that, that role. It is amazing what you guys have done. Chris, thanks so much for coming on. It was great talking to you. We'll have to uh, we'll have to have you back on when next next uh, breakthrough you guys have with CTE. Yeah, look forward to it. Thanks for having me, Troy. Really a pleasure. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, 
go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nursecore for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.